All right, turn with me to Exodus chapter 32. Oh, Exodus chapter 32. Didn't I say that? He's one of the ones that didn't follow the rules on the sign-up sheet. It's pretty self-explanatory. One, two, three, four. But all right, we'll go with it. <laughs> Actually, he hadn't even signed up yet. Exodus chapter 32, verse number 1, we'll read the first uh, eight verses. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Dear Father, Lord, we come to you in prayer. And Father, I pray that you fill me with your spirit tonight. I pray that your spirit is known amongst the, the congregation, Lord, and that our hearts and our ears are opened up what you would have for us. Now be with us all, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Some of us in this room tonight, over the last couple of weeks, have made a New Year's resolution. Whether it is to lose weight, exercise, get a little more fit physically. And I wouldn't hesitate to, to say that we have already compromised in just a few short days on those New Year's resolutions. Myself, I had three. Number one, I wanted to get closer to Jesus. That was my number one thing until this morning. And pastor preached. Now I want to be more like Jesus. Being closer and being more like is two different things. Secondly, I wanted to exercise more. I figured getting off the couch was not good enough in 2021. And so now I'm going from the couch to the refrigerator and back to the chair. And I figure that will keep me going. And number three, I want to read two books a month. Two books a month. That's my goal for 2022. And it's not for any glorification. I just need to read more. I love to read. I used to hate to read as a young person. Now I enjoy it. And it's going to take some, some commitment to be able to read two books a month. And if I don't read two books a month and I compromise and don't do it one day, well, that's not really going to hurt me. It's not that bad, right? But compromise in the Christian life, it can destroy families, change lives, and it can ruin churches. And what we saw was Aaron, Moses' brother, and his compromise. Most people today don't even think about the word compromise. They just do it. They say to themselves, hey, if I just go with the crowd and, and fit in, then it really won't affect me. Pastors all over America are compromising every day. If I just don't preach hard, then we'll get more people and our churches will grow. If I just don't preach against music, we'll get younger people in and we can have a contemporary service and, and our numbers will grow. Or if I change from preaching from the Word of God, the King James Bible, and preach another perversion, then, hey, I won't offend anybody anymore and our numbers will grow. Compromise. It is said that compromise is just the changing of the question to fit the answer. And that's exactly what it is. Number one, what was Aaron's compromise? Look at verse number one. 
And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. Number one, he listened to the people, his first compromise. The man of God should listen to God. We change every day. Our attitudes, our thoughts, our desires, our, our motives change every day. God does not change. So we need to listen to God and not to the people. In Luke chapter 11, verse 28, it says this, But he saith, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Deuteronomy 12, 28, Observe and hear all the words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee forever. When thou dost that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord thy God. Pastor's job is to please God, not man. Not man. Did you understand that? The pastor's job is to please God, not us. I believe our pastor has a real desire for that, to please God. A few years ago, I got a call early Christmas morning. A family member had died Christmas Day. And the young man that had passed away lived a life that was not very good. And they, of course, they asked me to do the funeral. And so I had prepared some. What do you say at a funeral of someone that you know that's not saved? So I was going to give them a, a hope message, uh, something that might draw them in to change their hearts. I got to the funeral home, and there was probably 100, 125 rough, rough bikers. I walked over to the casket right before I got ready to speak, and I looked in the casket to, to tell this young man, you know, to look at him one last time knowing where he was at. And as I looked over to the casket, I was stunned. There was cartons of cigarettes. There were cases of beer put in this casket with this young man. And my message totally changed. I told him as I got up, I said, listen, death is not a joke. Heaven and hell is real. And if he could come back today, he would ask you and beg you and plead you like the rich man in Luke chapter 16 to get saved and turn from your wicked ways. Well, after about 20 minutes of hard preaching, I, sh I shut it down and I went outside and stood behind the hearse as pastors do. And uh, the pallbearers were getting the casket together and they were putting the flowers on the van and I'm standing there waiting for them to, to bring the casket out and this huge biker guy came out smoking a cigarette and he stood right next to me and I thought, I'm fixing to die. <laughs> and I stood there and he smoked a cigarette and he had on the, the leather chaps for the bike the motorcycles. He had on the leather vest with the name of his biker club on the back. And I thought to myself, I'm about to die. And he's sitting there and he's smoking his cigarette and he's blowing it down at me. And once again, I thought, I'm about to die. And he flicked his ashes and he threw the cigarette down and he put it out and he said, uh, there's a lot of people in there that don't like what you said. I'm about to die. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm not here to please them. I'm here to please God. Amen. And you know what that guy did? He put his arm around me and said, I like that. I like it. Next time I'm in town, I'm coming by y'all's church. Amen. Now, I thought I was going to die. But they heard the truth. It's not our job to please you because unfortunately God's word doesn't please man. 
It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts going in and coming out. I know I've sat down there and been cut. So his first mistake was he listened to the people. Up, oh, make us gods. Aaron knew better. He was the one that God sent to find Moses in the wilderness. Secondly, he got away from the word of God. Look at verse number 8. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I have commanded them. They have made them molten calf, a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 9, He that turneth away his ear from the hearing of the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Do you get what it said? Aaron had quickly turned from God's word. He knew what God had said. He understood it. He was with Moses when God talked to Moses. And he tells us in that verse in Proverbs 28, 9, if we willingly don't come to church, he won't hear our prayers. But if we come to church and we willingly don't listen to the preaching, our prayers are an abomination. It doesn't matter where you're at. You understand that. We can sit here and look good at church and still not hear what the preachers got for us and still not obey what God is saying through the man of God. We need to stick with the word. Psalms 12, 6 and 7 says this, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried to furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God's word does not change. Amen. It's the only consistent thing we have in our life, you understand, is God and his word. Everything else changes. Your life can change in a matter of seconds. Somebody run through a red light. A few months ago over in Decatur, a guy had stopped getting off work at third shift, stopped to fill his tank up with gas, and a young man got out and shot him and killed him. That's how quick his life changed. Matthew 4.4 4 says this, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I want an every word Bible. This is nothing new to this crowd. You hear this all the time. I don't want a Bible that's constantly changing. You know, the King James Bible is the only copy of the, the Scriptures that is not copyrighted. You can take this Bible and you can sit down and you can copy it and give it to somebody else. That's what God wants. You, you can't do that with the NIV. You can't do it with the RSV. And they change the meaning of what the words are. The NIV calls Joseph Jesus' father. Well, if you do, do that, you take away the deity of Christ because God is Jesus' father. God and his word, as I said, are the only consistence that we have in our, in our lives. What was Aaron's compromise? He listened to the people. He got away from the word of God. Number three, he brought in false gods. Look at verse number four. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. We need to know about false gods. You know, we have false gods in our church that we bring in all the time. Let me give you some examples. Education can be a false god. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't strive to be the best a student that you can be, but when education becomes the number one thing in your life, that's an idol. Beauty for some of us. What are y'all laughing at? It can become an idol, especially for young ladies. 
Not so much young men, but young ladies. You stand in front of the mirror and you look at yourself and you think, how can I enhance my looks? And it becomes an idol. You become your own God. Family can become an idol. Well, we can't come to church. We're having, uh, we're having family night. Really? There's six other days of the week and you're going to have family night? I've heard it. I've heard it been said. Science can become an idol. Money can become an idol. You know, I was telling my Sunday school class this morning, I love the documentaries on uh, um, men that built America, if, you, if you've ever seen that program. You had Rockefeller, you had Vanderbilt, you had J.P. Morgan, and you had Carnegie. And how they, they couldn't stand each other. Each one of them wanted to be the richest man in the world. And, and to make the story short, J.P. Morgan bought Carnegie Steel and changed it to U.S. Steel. Carnegie became the richest man in the world at that time. And he built Carnegie Hall and he invited the other three to the grand opening. Just to give them a little jab. And they asked Rockefeller, Mr. Rockefeller, you're one of the richest men in the world. How much is enough? And this was his quote, enough is never enough. It's never enough. If we find a $10 bill laying on the ground, we'd say, why wasn't it a 20? You win Publishers Clearinghouse, $5,000 a week for the rest of your life and somebody else you choose. Well, it used to be 7000 Why did they go down? We're never happy. We have beautiful homes that we live in, and we're not satisfied. We have cars that get us from point A to point B. We're never satisfied. We always want something else. Hey, put God first. Amen. Let God be your idol. He tells us in, the, in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, it says this, this is the Ten Commandments. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. God said, listen, don't have a crucifix with Jesus Christ on it. That's right. what he said. Don't set an idol in your house. Years ago, I, I might have been the the second or third trip to Mexico that I went with the church, we would always go shopping downtown Saltillo, and, and I bought a little shelf, and it had, I thought it'd be great. And then I bought, uh, for my youngest daughter, two dolls, a little Mexican guy and a little Mexican girl. And uh, they were in their, their native garb, and I thought, man, this would be great. I got back to the, the Joins' house, and Brother Joins said, hey, what would you get? And I showed him, and he said, ah, ah. I said, what? He said, well, the dolls are Catholic idols. I didn't know. I thought they were just dolls. You know, I'm ignorant. Gringo. <laughs> thought it was just dolls. He said, you know, you can take them and keep them, but I'm just telling you. Well, now I'm not ignorant of the fact. I wish you had not said anything. Now I've got to buy something else. And he said, what else you get? And I said, well, i got this shelf right here. I think my wife would really like it. Ah. <laughs> what? He said, well, you see that little hole in the shelf right there? I said, yes. He said, that's where the Catholics put their candle and light it. Oh, my goodness. Now I've got to buy her something else too. But God says, make no image of anything. You understand, my God is not on a cross. My Savior is in heaven. Stephen says that in Acts chapter 7, verse 55. 
He saw Jesus at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. We have to be careful. His mistakes was he listened to the people. He got away from the word of God. He brought in false gods. Number four, he brought in the world's music. Look at verses 17 and 18. Verse 17 of chapter 32, it says this, And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but it is the noise of them that sing do I hear. See, Moses and Joshua, even though Joshua was not allowed on the mountain at the time, he was away from the people. He wasn't, away, uh, he wasn't with the people hearing them. Now you remember when Moses was getting the Ten Commandments from God, they heard the thunderings. They saw the lightnings and the smoke on the top of Mount Sinai. And they still said, uh, as far as this Moses, we don't, we want not what has happened to him. So we're going to make us gods. And when they get close, Moses that had been with God for 40 days and Joshua that had been at the base of the mountain, they both heard it different, didn't they? Joshua thought it was a war, that they were being taken over. And Moses understood that God had already told him I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill every one of them because of the sin. Don't you remember? Mo- Moses didn't understand why God was wanting to wipe them all out. And he talked God basically out of it. But when Moses got there and heard that, the music that was playing, turn with me. This isn't my, in the message, but turn with me to Psalms chapter 150. I know it's in the Bible. It's the last Psalms. I'll get there in a minute. Psalms 150, it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye, praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of trumpets. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high sound, sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You know what you don't see in that group? Drums. Because drums were for battle. We have pastors that compromise and bring the world's music into the church. It does not please God. It doesn't please God at all to have the the rhythm. If you ever get the opportunity to read Dennis Corll's book, The Pied Piper of Rock Music, I suggest you read it, parents. It's eye-opening. He takes... Quotes from musicians, rock musicians, and tell exactly what they believe music can do. Mick Jagger said without singing a lyric, he could have the crowd killing each other just by the rhythm of the music. Because it's so powerful. What is Satan? He's a minister of the air. Who's over, over control of the earth right now? Satan. What do most young people fall into? Music. So if, hey, if, if the pastor can slide in the, the contemporary Christian music a little bit and then we'll change it a little bit, we'll dim the lights, that's not God-pleasing. God is light and there is no darkness in Him. You go into a church and you can't hardly see yourself, you need to turn around and walk out. You go into a church and you see a silhouette of drums, you need to turn around and walk out. They're not where you're at. 
You know, we need to listen to the right type of music. It comes from the heart. Ephesians 5.19 says this, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's what music is supposed to do. You remember Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. For thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. When we sing praises to God, He gets happy. When we thank Him in song for what He's done for us, He rejoices. It says in James 5, 13, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Everyone in here should be able to sing psalms even in times of trouble. If we think about what God has done for us, even in the hardest of times, on that back side of the mountain, we still can sing praises to God. Because if you're saved and you're born again, you never have to worry about dying and going to hell. That's enough to sing about. The Bible says it shall rain on the just and the unjust alike. We're going to have hard times. The music is a means of teaching. Colossians 3.16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Ecclesiastes 7, 5, and 6, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a, for a man to hear the song of fools. Man, just turn on the TV. Go to the mall. Get in an elevator. The songs that you hear in the elevator take you back, adults my age and a little younger, to where you were when you first heard that song. That's the power of music over you. Now, I've got friends that still struggle with music. I've got no problem with it. I, I never really was a big music guy, so it, I can take it or leave it. But let me tell you, when I sing spiritual songs like we sang tonight, my spirit glorifies. I get so excited. Years ago, I was preaching at Shawnee Baptist College, and they probably had 400 students. And I was talking on music and, and compromising. You're going to school to be a pastor or a missionary or a missionary's wife or a, a, Christian, <coughs> excuse me, a Christian school teacher. I said, how many of you have a car here at college? And probably 10% of them raised their hand. I said, after the service, I want you to do me a favor. Will all of you do me a favor? And they shook their head. I said, get your car keys and bring them to me and set them right here. I'm going to go out to your car, turn it on, and see what's on your radio and see if you've already compromised. See, that's how it works. I'm not there to please. I'm not here to please them. I'm here to please God. And if I know something, what the power of music has over people, I need to tell them. So what was Aaron's compromise? He listened to the people. He got away from the word of God. He brought in false gods. He brought in the world's music. What was the cost of Aaron's compromise? It cost him his testimony with Moses. Look at verse 21. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people do unto thee, that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? Aaron, Aaron, listen to me, my brother. What were you thinking? Why did you compromise? You saw what was happening on the mount when I was with our Lord and Savior. What was going on in your head for you to listen to the people and do this? He lost his testimony. You think any time after that that Moses had to go somewhere and Aaron was in charge? That he thought, man, should I leave him alone? How many of us parents have said that with our kids? Man, should I leave them, leave them alone again? Should I give them the responsibility that I gave them the time before and it didn't work out well? It 
He cost Aaron and his two sons. They died. He cost Aaron the, the testimony with the people. Look at verse number 25. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, and Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, they had no blush. All because of a pastor's compromise. He had his congregation dancing. So we saw what was Aaron's compromise. We saw the cost of his compromise. It cost him his testimony. You know, Gerald Myers told me years ago, it takes a lifetime to build a testimony on, and only a matter of moments to lose it. And trying to get that testimony back is almost impossible. I didn't say it was impossible. It's almost impossible to get it back. Where's your testimony at with God? Where's your testimony with your family? So what was the effect of his compromise? Look at verse 34. The people had heartache. Therefore now go and lead the people into the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, my angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. He said, listen, you go ahead and go where I'm going to send you. I'm going to send an angel with him, with you to watch over and protect you just like he did when they were in the wilderness, remember? And he said, but listen, when I am come, it's coming. Now, I would say that out of the two million somewhere around that Israelites that came out of Egypt, not all of them followed that path. Would you? Wouldn't you think that there was a remnant of those that did not fall into that type of heresy? But the people had heartache. Secondly, the people lost their lives. Look at verses 27 and 28. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of them that day about 3,000 men because of a pastor's compromise. 3,000 people died. If he had just waited on Moses, if he would have just stayed in the Word, if he would have just kept the world out, those men would be living. Sons, fathers, grandfathers, uncles. This was just the men that didn't say anything about the women. D.L. Moody told a story about a young man who enlisted in the army. And he was sent to his regiment. The first night he was in the barracks with about 15 other young men who passed the time by playing cards and gambling. Before retiring, he fell on his knees and prayed. And they began to curse him and laugh at him and throw their boots at him. So it went on the next night and the next. And finally the young man went and told the chaplain what had taken place in their barracks. And, what should he, and he asked him, what should he do about it? Well, said the chaplain, you're not at home now. And the other men have just as much right to the barracks as you have. It makes them mad to hear you pray, and the Lord will hear you just as well as if you say your prayers in bed and don't provoke them. For weeks after, the chaplain didn't see the young man again. But one day he met him and asked, By the way, young man, did you take my advice? 
He replied, I did for two or three nights. How did it work? Well, the young man said, I felt like a whipped dog. And on the third night, I got out of my bunk and knelt down by my bed, and I prayed to God. Well, asked the chaplain, how did that work? The young soldier answered, we have a prayer meeting there now. Every night. And three have been converted to Christ. And we're praying for the rest. He continues and says this. I'm so tired of weak Christianity. Let us be out and out for Christ. Let us give no uncertain sound. If the world wants to call us fools, fools, let them. It's only for a little while. The crowning day is coming. Thank God for the privilege we have of confessing Christ as our Savior. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 5, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For there will come a time where they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they turn their, turn their ears from the truth. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. You know, I am so grateful for Pastor Allison. And I'm not just saying this because he was, he's here. I don't think we realize what we really have. You know, we joined in 1994, Madison Baptist Church. And he's never changed. He's always preached the same thing. Why? Because God's Word doesn't change. Who's changed then? Us. Us. Things that we said amen two years ago, now we're saying oh my. Why? Have we compromised? Have we fallen into that trap? I'm so grateful also that we have a have a God that never changes and that tells us He can't change. In Malachi 3.6, For I, the Lord thy God, I change not. But unfortunately, men are not God. We need to pray for our pastor. Can you imagine the load that's on him day after day after day? Not only his problems, but our missionaries' problems, y'all's problems, the death of church members, the burden that's on him. We need to raise his arms up. We need men to show up for the prayer breakfast this coming Saturday and pray for our pastor. Pray that God keeps him strong in the ministry, keeps him strong in the Word of God, keeps him strong in the faith. And that rebukes Satan from his life. Because if Satan can destroy our pastor, it would destroy us. You understand what I'm saying? Now that I'm on staff, I see things different than the normal church person. I understand why rules have to be made and enforced. It would be a It would be a heavy burden to have everybody's problems on you. I mean, sometimes I can't even handle my own. Are you with me? Is there anyone in here that's never been so burdened with a burden that you can't eat? That you can't sleep? That all you can do is dwell on that 24 hours a day. Is there anybody else besides me? If if you haven't been there, you will be. You will be. But unfortunately, men aren't God, and we need to pray. It will make us all better. When He's strong... We're strong. When he preaches hard, we should like it. 
There's too many pastors around America that don't preach the Word of God. They don't preach hard. And you can see, I was talking to one young man a few months ago, and I said, why has your standards dropped? It makes no sense. He said, well, I've, I've matured. I'm sorry, you get closer to God, you get more standards than less. You get more convictions than less. No one excuse is as good as another in any aspect but with God. Because we're all going to stand before a holy God and give an account. Aaron, boy, what a, what a mistake he made. Listening to the people, bringing in the false gods, listening to the wrong type of music. What did it cost him? It cost him his testimony with everybody. It cost him his two sons. The effect, 3,000 men lost their lives because of a pastor. Compromise is a scary word for the Christian. Why? Because it changes lives, it destroys families, and it ruins churches. Dear Father, Lord, we come to you in prayer. And Father, I thank you for tonight and the blessings that you've given us. Father, once again, I'm saying this for my benefit. I thank you for my pastor. Father, I pray that you put protection around him and his wife and his family. and Lead, guide him, give him the direction that he needs on every aspect of the ministry. And Father, let us be a church that appreciates what we have. And Father, we just thank you. If there's one here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, Father, I pray tonight will be the night of salvation and they can, they can come forward and accept you as their Lord and God. Thank you so much for what you do for us now. In Jesus' name, amen.